Oral questions, questions oral, the honorable member for Milton. The Prime Minister's decision to appoint Unifor to his panel to determine eligibility for a half billion dollar media package has destroyed this government's credibility. Unifor is a highly partisan group and it has very aggressive and partisan goals and they've made it clear that their objective is to elect Liberals and to defeat Conservatives. And yet the Prime Minister has chosen to appoint them to this very important panel. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to know from the Prime Minister, why doesn't he just openly admit he's stacking the deck for himself? Yeah. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we know that a strong, independent media is a cornerstone of Canadian democracy. We're therefore acting to ensure that media continue to hold elected officials to account. We're ensuring that both employees and employers are represented on the independent panel. But when it comes to the media, the Conservatives' only plan is to eliminate CBC and Radio Canada, which would mean no local coverage in smaller communities, the end of an institution valued by Canadians for generations, unlike uh, what the leader of the opposition put in his uh, leadership platform, we will not let that happen. The Honourable Member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious issue. This government has indicated that they are setting up a panel which will have on it an entity that is clearly biased in yeah. their favour, and they will be in charge of determining criteria for a half billion dollar media bailout package. Now, he can tell us what former positions used to be of the opposition, but the reality is his position right now is this, that he is undermining the independence yeah. of the journalists who are very concerned. Will he remove you to four from this panel. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that any strong democracy relies on a strong media, an independent strong media that is there to do its job of holding politicians to account. And we need to make sure that both employers and employees are part of the panel that will oversee uh, the independent media fund. This is something that we understand. The Conservatives, however, continue to attack organized labour, including attacking the largest public sector private sector union in the country because their hate for labor does not know limits. Well, we're going to... The Honourable Member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, for the Prime Minister to stand there and tell somebody who grew up in Cape Breton and is a product of a coal mining family that she hates labor is absolutely disgusting. 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 deciding who's a proper journalist and who's a proper news outlet. You could have done better, Prime Minister. Why didn't you? Yeah. Uh, the Alvin Member for Milton is an experienced member, and I remind her to direct her comments to the chair. Order. 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 The Honourable Member for Carleton will come to order now. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I wonder where the member opposite's high dudgeon was when her government was bringing in anti-union legislation 525 and 377, which were the very first things we eliminated when Canadians voted them out and voted us back in. We will always respect organized labour in this country. We will work with them and the hundreds of thousands of Canadians they represent. We're going to continue to stand up for an independent media. That means supporting employers and employees, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals would destroy the credibility of journalists just five months before an election. This Prime Minister has included Unifor, a self-proclaimed liberal-leaning union, and the Conservatives' worst nightmare, and the, our leader. Will the Prime Minister do the right thing and remove Unifor from the panel 
the panel deciding how to divvy up the $600 million in Liberal handouts to the media. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we all know that strong and independent media is key to our democracy. The media hold governments accountable. We want to make sure that both management and workers are represented on the advisory panel. The leader of the opposition decimated Radio Canada and the CBC, the former Conservative leader. There was this harmed local coverage in regions and uh, damaged a respected and much loved Canadian institution. Donald Member. Mr. Speaker, here's what certain journalists have said. Mario Dumont, Caroline Saint-Hilaire, and Daniel Lessard are uncomfortable with this decision by the Liberal Prime Minister. Don Martin of CTV said this was the gravest threat to the independence of the press. So I repeat my question to the Prime Minister. What's he waiting for? Why doesn't he boot Unifor off this panel that will be deciding on how to hand, hand out millions of dollars to the media. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, everyone knows the Conservatives hate unions, and they brought in lots of anti-union legislation under the previous government, and we've had to repeal that in order to be able to work with the unions. We respect unions' role in representing workers. And that's why on this independent panel, we wanted not just management and owners, we wanted staff representation so that journalists and workers could be represented to strike a balance so that it could be truly independent. We will always protect our independent media. Oh, member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker. Services is a Canadian value. But the OECD reports that Canada now ranks 25th out of 37 countries on social spending. At the same time, the Liberals gave $29 billion a year to rich companies with no strings attached. Conservatives and Liberals have starved our public services while using that money, using our money to help the richest companies. When will the Liberals stop helping the wealthy corporate buddies over the public services that families count on? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite wants to talk about services that family counts on. He might want to ask his colleagues in the NDP why they voted against the Canada Child Benefit, which gives more money to 9 out of 10 Canadian families and has lifted 300,000 kids out of poverty over these past years. On top of that, our investments in community, in workers, in families have lifted <clears throat> over 825,000 Canadians out of poverty because we know that investing in support for the middle class and those working hard to join it is how to create growth for the entire economy. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. People are clear they're having trouble making ends meet and they're disappointed by the Liberal government. They can't, they shouldn't be doing the same old things that the Conservatives did, eliminating services that Canadians count on. And they should stop spending on giving handouts to big corporations. When are the Liberals going to stop giving more to big business instead of ordinary people? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The member opposite doesn't seem to realize that the first thing we did was increase taxes on the wealthy in order to reduce them on the middle class. We then followed up with the Canada Child Benefit, which raised 300,000 children out of poverty. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals voted against both of those measures, but we will continue. One million new jobs have been created by Canadians under our watch, and at the same time, 825,000 Canadians have been raised out of poverty. We are helping people, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. We have to help our families and protect our workers. The Liberals want to please President Trump and rush 
to ratify the new NAFTA, but there's no reason to do this. The government can and must put pressure on the Americans to fix this deal. American Democrats are trying to improve NAFTA to protect our jobs and protect drug prices. By refusing to support the Democrats, the Liberals are not engaging in progressive trade. If the priority is to protect jobs, why the rush, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? We negotiated a good deal for Canadians, for Canadian workers, and for families all across Canada. But we're not the only ones saying this. Look at Jerry, Ty Jerry Dias from Unifor said that this is much better than the deal of the past. The Canada Labour Congress has said that the renewed NAFTA is a step in the right direction for labour to protect workers from discrimination. And Lino Ledemarichu from Chrysler in Windsor is very proud of the work we, do we did in negotiating this deal. <laughs> for Burnaby South. There is no Canadian worker that wants to rush through this deal if there is a chance to work with the Americans to better protect their jobs. Here, here, here. Yeah. Not only does this, job, this deal risk jobs, it could drive up the cost of medication for families. Clearly, it could be better. Democrats in Congress are fighting for improvements on jobs and protecting the environment. Will the Liberals stop rushing to help Donald Trump and instead work with progressives to fix this flawed deal? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we worked hard to negotiate the best possible deal for Canadians and that's exactly what we got. But you don't have to take our, our word for it. Union leaders from Unifor, uh, from uh, the Canadian Labour Congress and even Lino De Medico, team leader at Chrysler's Windsor Assembly Plant, said we're actually very proud of the job that Canadian government did, and kudos to the negotiator. But the reality, Mr. Speaker, is if the NDP doesn't want to listen to union leaders, let them listen to their own MP for Rosemont La Petite Patrie, who said this is the best deal possible and it protects workers all around this country. I ask members, I know it's near the end of the term, but I ask members to remember that it's rude to interrupt and we should allow people to speak when they have the floor and not speak when we don't have the floor. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, many, including those in the media, have expressed concerns with the Liberal $600 million press bailout. Andrew Coyne wrote about the bailout. It intrudes the government into areas that it has no business being in, and it's a disaster now unfolding. Mr. Speaker, that's because the Liberals have put overtly anti-conservative uniform on the committee that will oversee which media gets funding. Will the Prime Minister finally admit that this is all part of the Liberals' plan to rig the next election? The Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, the Conservatives are playing a very dangerous game. They're attacking the media. They're saying that our journalists can be bought. Yesterday, they said that we're, our journalists were fossils, Mr. Speaker. Instead of supporting professional journalism, they're attacking them, Mr. Speaker. We say quite the opposite. We have to support professional journalism in taking out one constitution, one principle, the independence and the freedom of the press. Order. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we trust the media. It's the Prime Minister Canadians don't trust because we've all seen how vindictive he gets when anyone dares stand up to him. Mr. Speaker, even the CBC said the government just made a toxic media bailout plan even worse. We agree with the CBC. In federal and provincial campaigns across the country, Reverse the decision. Get Unifor off this committee for Christ. Honourable Minister of Heritage. 
I want to talk about CBC. Let's talk about CBC, Mr. Speaker. The leader of opposition just said that they would like to dictate CBC how they cover their story, how they tell their stories, Mr. Speaker, and that's totally unacceptable. And when he was asked he was cut, if he was going to cut CBC once again, he didn't answer, Mr. Speaker. We're saying we need more professional journalism, not less. That's what we're moving forward with this, Mr. Speaker, respecting one fundamental principle, the independence of the press. The Honourable Member for Belchasse-les-Echemins-Lévis. Mr. Speaker, the independence of the press is precisely what the Heritage Minister says a democracy needs. But she's the one who appointed you, Unifor, to this panel, the Conservative leader's worst nightmare. If there was any chance this process was not going to be politicized, that's long gone now. When will the Liberals stop attacking the credibility of journalists? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's quite strange to hear this coming from a Conservative who would like to get rid of the CBC and Radio-Canada. The Conservatives are playing a dangerous game here, attacking journalists and calling them fossils. Unlike them, what we're doing is putting in place a program that respects the independence and freedom of the press, along with other core principles. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Les Etchemins Lévis. Mr. Speaker, the cuts to CBC were done by the Liberals, and the Heritage Minister is now undermining the credibility of journalists. A journalist from the National Post said they're putting the wolf in the hen house. The group includes a hyper-partisan union. Does the minister, can he take off his rose-colored glasses and get rid of Unifor and hold legit elections, or are they going to be rigged? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Mr. Speaker, we needed an independent but representative panel, representative of the whole industry. It requires owners, it requires journalists, but it also requires people who represent the workers, people who live in various places, local and national media. That's what you need, a balance. You need to make a, f a fundamental, there's a fundamental issue here, the freedom of the press, and instead of undermining journalists' credibility, they should be standing up and supporting them, because our media are one of the pillars of our democracy. The old member for Caribou Prince George many times today, even though, he, yeah, much as I enjoy hearing those tones, I prefer to hear it only when he has the floor. Hello. I remember for Chilliwack Hope. Engage Canada is an anti-conservative organization that tries to influence elections. Unifor boss Jerry Dias has boasted that Unifor was a major financial supporter of Engage Canada in the last election. The Prime Minister has appointed Unifor to his panel to determine eligibility for a half a billion dollar media bailout package. At the same time, Unifor is bankrolling anti-conservative special interest groups. Will the Prime Minister finally kick Unifor off this panel or is this just part of his plan to try to rig the next election? The Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. Let's look at the facts. What our government did is bring in Bill C-76, which actually strengthens the rules around advertising and activities for third parties in the lead-up to the election. We brought in a pre-writs period, a pre writ spending period, which will begin on June 30th. This is the first time in Canadian history that we're doing this to make sure that there is a fair and level playing field when it comes to our elections. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Unifor is spending union dues collected from its members to fund anti-conservative special interest groups like Engage Canada who are trying to influence the outcome of the upcoming election. Yeah. Knowing their anti-conservative bias, these Liberals have still appointed Unifor to a supposedly independent panel who will decide which media will get access to a half a billion dollars in government subsidies. Will the Prime Minister finally kick Unifor off of this panel, or is this all just part of his plan to try to rig the next election. The Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. 
as we said yesterday, the Conservatives are going down a dangerous path. This is just another line in their story of trying to undermine our democratic institutions. They've gone after the CEO of Elections Canada. They've gone after the Commissioner of Canada Elections. They've gone after the Commissioner of the Debates Commission. And now they're going after a free and independent press. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve better. Democracy deserves better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Mr. Speaker, even though the new NAFTA is full of shortcomings, the Liberal government is going full steam ahead to ratify it. American dairy and poultry producers are on the verge of flooding our market. The jobs and rights of workers are not adequately protected. The price of drugs may go up, and environmental protections are lacking. In short, a lot of not-so-progressive stuff that could do us a lot of damage. Why don't the Liberals fix these problems instead of rushing ratification? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, what the NDP should understand is that reopening this deal is like opening Pandora's box. Why is the NDP willing to risk the certainty for our economy. They would be naive to think that reopening this deal would be beneficial to Canadians. The NDP is playing a very dangerous game here. Six. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's simple. We want a better deal for working people. While Liberals are ramming through the ratification of the new NAFTA, Democrats in the U.S. are fighting for a more progressive deal. Canadians want to know why the Liberals aren't. Once again, the Liberals are putting their interests ahead of priority number one, protecting Canadian jobs. If they push this through before the Democrats fix the deal, they're throwing away a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make trade fair for Canadian workers. Under NAFTA, we lost over 400,000 manufacturing jobs alone. Simple question, why are the Liberals doing Donald Trump's bidding at the expense of Canadians? The Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, what the NDP needs to understand is that reopening this deal would be like opening Pandora's box. We have an agreement that safeguards more than $2 billion a day in cross-border trade. The NDP are naive at best and playing political games at worst to suggest that Canada would benefit from reopening the deal. If the NDP wants to take a page out of Donald Trump's playbook and withdraw should have the courage to say so. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, a few days ago, the Environment Minister said something that was offensive, to say the least. She said, we've learned in the House of Commons that if you repeat your press lines loudly, people will believe you. Basically, repeat and shout, it will work. What an insult to the truth and to the intelligence of Canadians, as well as to all of us here. How are we supposed to believe anything the minister says about the environment when she's said that? The Honourable Parliament, the Honourable Minister, it's funny to hear the Liberals talking about credibility and the environment in the same sentence. Only Conservatives like those could be against the polluter pay principle. Only those Conservatives would say that we are proud of what we've done to protect the environment, to protect Canadians. We're proud of protecting the planet. We will invest in order to protect Canadians and our environment. I'd like to remind the member for Port Neuf, Jacques Cartier, not to shout while someone else has the floor. No, no, member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the environment, the Liberals are all talk, no action. In fact, they imposed the Liberal carbon tax and paid a Houston company $4.5 billion. Mr. Speaker, we're not the only ones who can see that the Liberals talk out of both sides of their mouth. The Liberal government is going to miss its Liberal, uh, it's Paris targets by 79 million tons, and the minister knows it. What are they going to say when it comes time to renew the Paris agreements, which they haven't even met? The Honourable Minister. 
people watching, and especially in the writing of my colleague, can see the true colors of the Conservatives. They have no plan, and yet they dare criticize ours. The Conservatives are telling Canadians not to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They have no plan to fight the consequences of natural disasters, no plan for future generations. We have a plan. We are taking action. We will protect the environment on behalf of Canadians. Member for Carleton. Why is he always screaming over there? <laughs> the answer came from the Environment Minister who said, and I quote, if you actually say it louder, we've learned in the House of Commons, if you repeat it, if you say it louder, if that is your talking point, people will totally believe it, Mr. Speaker. So that's their strategy, to convince Canadians they will be better off by paying higher gas prices while missing the Paris Accord by 80 million tons of carbon. Isn't that really their strategy, to say it louder even when it's wrong? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I will say it very calmly. We will take no lessons from the Conservative, Mr. Speaker. Only Conservatives can be against putting a price on pollution. We are proud, Mr. Speaker, to act on climate change. We are proud to protect this generation and future generation. We are proud to protect our planet. We will continue to invest in disaster mitigation and resilience so that future generations don't have to spend year after year for damages caused by climate change, Mr. Speaker. A little calm is so nice. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, that calmed him down a little bit, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Unfortunately, Liberal members in the House don't realize that while they raise the volume and raise taxes at the same time, they make both our ears and our wallets worse off. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, the member across the way, now that he has calmed down, sitting behind a leader who has advocated a buck 60 a liter gas prices. Will he stand today and tell us exactly how high gas prices will go once the full and final Liberal carbon tax is in place? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the problem with the Conservative, either we shout and they don't listen or we speak quietly and they don't listen, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> but one thing is clear, is that Canadians were watching us at home and listening, Mr. Speaker, and they know one thing for sure. They know that they have no plan for the environment, and they know that there is going to be no reduction in greenhouse gas emissions with these Conservatives. They will take no action to protect communities against natural disaster. They will take no action to protect this generation and future generation. Mr. Speaker, we made a different choice. We're going to invest to protect the planet, to protect Canadians, and to protect our environment. Now, the Honourable Member for Cowichan Malahat Langford. Mr. Speaker, supply managed sectors are always the first to be sacrificed in trade agreements. Between concessions granted through CETA, CPTPP, and now NAFTA 2.0, the dairy sector is seeing close to a 10% loss to our domestic market for milk production. Democrats in the U.S. are working to improve some of the shortcomings of NAFTA 2.0, but mm -hmm. here in Canada, Liberals are ready to accept that what they've given up is the best Canada can get. If the trade deal can be improved upon, why is this government trying to rush through ratification now when a better deal for Canadian farmers is attainable. Yes. yes. Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for giving me the opportunity to reassure the member as well as dairy producers throughout Canada and all supply managed producers that the work is going well. We've already announced the amount that they will receive under the most recent budget and over the coming weeks. I trust that we'll be able to give them more details on the process that will assist them in terms of compensation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Berthier-Masquinonger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Quebec cheese market has slowed 
slowed down because of the massive influx of European cheese. The Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement with uh, the European Union is not benefiting small-scale producers. For example, the Domaine Féodal in Saint-Geneviève-de-Bertier is not even operating at 50 percent capacity, and they're doing all they can to protect their workers from this agreement signed by the Liberals. This is a cry from the heart, Mr. Speaker. Does the government have a plan to protect small-scale cheese producers in Quebec? The Minister of Agriculture. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to reassure my colleague and all uh, dairy processors, once again, we made a firm commitment for all supply managed sectors. We created working groups. We take their work very seriously and the discussions very seriously. And you'll see how closely we've been listening to them all as soon as possible. The Honourable Member for uh, Saint-Jean, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Official La Languages has been Chris Con crossing the country to meet with minority Francophone communities. It didn't take her long to realize that the conservative cuts were jeopardizing the survival of the community organizations that promote our language rights. After bringing in the most ambitious official languages action plan in our history, the minister recently began the task of modernizing the Official Languages Act. Can she tell this House about the most recent developments? The Honourable Minister of Official Languages. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today in Ottawa, 500 <coughs> individuals are here to speak and celebrate. And today, I had an opportunity to tell good news. Good news about online learning in French and English developed by Radio-Canada CBC. This tool will be free, accessible to all, and the name of this tool will be the Moril, in honour of Moril Belanger, a great defender of official languages. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the media is reporting that hundreds of criminals, including drug dealers and contract killers from Latin America, have entered Canada on fake Mexican passports. And yesterday, the Minister of Public Safety attempted to reassure us, saying that the numbers reported by the media cannot be verified. Canadians are not reassured if the Public Safety Minister doesn't immediately know what's happening at our border. So has the minister managed to verify the numbers today? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, again, the, uh, the premise of the question is entirely bogus. Since January 2018, lifting the visas with Mexico has resulted in Canada gaining nearly 500,000 legitimate travellers, generating millions of dollars in economic benefits. And at the border, since January of 2018, the CBSA has prepared inadmissibility reports for approximately 190 Mexican nationals on criminality grounds. That accounts for 0.0. 0.04% of all Mexican travelers seeking. The Honorable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, it is the Minister of Public Safety that is charged with keeping Canadians safe, but he doesn't know what's happening at our border and can't tell us how many drug lords and contract killers are flooding into the country on fake Mexican passports. Every day this minister doesn't have control of our border is a day that Canadians are at risk. Can the minister tell us when he might be able to verify the number of criminals entering Canada unchecked, or even how these criminals are able to enter Canada with fake passports? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member simply refuses to hear. Let me repeat the point. At the border, since January of 2018, CBSA prepared inadmissibility reports for approximately 190 Mexican nationals on criminality grounds. That accounts for 0.04% of all Mexican travellers seeking entry to Canada. Canadian laws are being effectively enforced by the CBSA and by the RCMP. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, it's all very well 
for the minister to talk about 190 Mexican illegals being returned to the country thanks to the CBSA. But what we want to know is whether or not the Minister of Public Safety believes that the reports about these 400 Mexican illegals entering Canada. Mr. Speaker, uh, simply uh, uh, repeating unverified information uh, does nothing for the security and the safety of Canadian borders. The facts are that when a person crosses the border or arrives at a port of entry and presents a problem with either identification or perhaps not turning up for appropriate uh, proceedings or presenting any kind of public danger, they can and they are detained until Canadian officials are satisfied of their status and their safety. Uh, the the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute-Saint-Charles. Once again, Mr. Speaker, and once again, this is consistent with a government that doesn't believe in safety. There was a one-hour-long report by a journalist who went to Mexico and saw the information and saw that there are cartel members, including 400 of them, operating in Montreal. So I'd like to know what measures are being taken to find them. Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, when anyone is suspected of criminal activity in Canada, whether they are a Canadian citizen or a foreigner attempting to enter the country, the appropriate authorities, either CBSA at the border or the RCMP, pursue every measure under Canadian law to investigate them, to charge them, if they are inadmissible in Canada, to remove them and send them home. Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, salmon farms in Clockwood Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island are experiencing a devastating sea lice emergency for the second year in a row. Again this year, juvenile wild salmon are being exposed to lethal loads of sea lice with infection rates of up to 100%. British Columbia has never seen levels like this before, and wild Chinook salmon are on the brink of extinction. Yeah. When will the minister enforce the law and protect yes. wild salmon? Here, here. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, work to manage risk with uh, provincial uh, authorities and with uh, stakeholders in the industry. With respect to sea lice, every single licensee has as a condition of its license a requirement to monitor outbreaks of sea lice. Um, funding is in place. Uh, funding it has been provided and all policy with regards to sea lice, with regards to aquaculture, will be based on science and based on consultation with all appropriate stakeholders. Thank you, Mr. Honourable Speaker. Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, Liberals promised to lower Canada's sky-high drug prices by improving the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board, but backed down after opposition from Donald Trump and the drug lobby. They then signed a new NAFTA that the Parliamentary Budget Officer says will cost Canadians billions more for medicine. And now, this government is gutting a crucial World Health Assembly resolution aimed at reducing global health uh, drug prices. Why are the Liberals doing big pharma's bidding and failing to lower the cost of medication for all Canadians? The Minister of Health. Pharma care program, the first thing that we have to do is to lower drug prices. The first thing that we did, we're in the process of modernizing the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board. We have also joined the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, and so far we have saved billions of dollars because we're able to bulk purchase drugs with other provinces and territories. And finally, we've launched the Advisory Council on the implementation of a National Pharma care program, and I look forward to receiving their final report later on next month. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for beauport Les Malou. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it is so inconceivable for a Canadian government to have deliberately prevented families of our brave fallen soldiers from attending a war ceremony. Not only is it insulting to our fallen soldiers, it's also insulting for their close relatives. The minister was there. He knew all the details of the event. When did he know that the families of the victims wouldn't be there? The minister is the boss. He's a former military member. Why did he approve this disrespectful decision? Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate Mana Bakati's question, and yes, there was a mistake made. I can assure you I talked to the veteran today. The veteran will be in Normandy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Speaker, the Minister of Defence knew in advance that the families of the fallen 
will be excluded from the Afghan memorial dedication. He was there after making this cruel and heartless decision. Canadians have witnessed his government's shameful contempt for those who gave their lives. Why would he dishonour his position and approve such a ceremony? Yeah. Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, as I did, I said in the House yesterday and outside uh, to, the me uh, to the media as well, um, I offer my heartfelt apologies to the families of, of the fallen uh, for, for this uh, ceremony. Um, they will, the families of our fallen will always have access to, the, to this memorial, and an appropriate uh, ceremony will be organized um, for them, Mr. Speaker. But I ask the member opposite to stop playing politics and trying to make it seem like that they have a better monopoly, Mr. Speaker. We went to the uh, function with party under the stars, Mr. Speaker, we can we're publicly stand together and ask the members to stand together and look. I hear Order. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Enter Lake Eastman, and let's not have any interruptions of the question or the answer, please. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, uh, that's not leadership when you're try trying to uh, put, put wiggle words there instead of making a decision. Our Canadian Armed Forces and our veterans want a defence minister, not a spectator. This defence minister sat idly by during a secret ceremony for the Afghanistan War Memorial instead of standing up for the families of the fallen. Here, here. As someone who served in Afghanistan, it's shocking that the minister could be so thoughtless when it comes to honouring our fallen soldiers. When did the defence minister take part in the secret ceremony? Why did he take part in the secret ceremony when he knew, and he knew, it excluded the families of the fall? The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to politicize or dignify the, the members' uh, insinuations in this regard. As I stated, I want to offer my heartfelt apologies to the families of our fallen. Um, uh, this uh, memorial will always um, be accessible uh, to our, our families. Plus, uh, an appropriate uh, um, uh, ceremony will be organized uh, for the families, but I ask the member to stop playing politics in this regard and work together, Mr. Speaker. And he, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Order. 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 Members need to remember that this is the House of Commons and it's a place where we have to allow others to speak. Even if we don't like what we hear, it's still important that we do that. And have the Honourable Member for Monterville. Speaker, this week the International Grand Committee on Big Data, Privacy and Democracy is meeting here in Ottawa to understand how governments around the world can tackle challenges to our democracies. Nous savons que le Canada we know that Canada has a strong democracy and is an example for the world. However, there is still a lot of work to do to develop our open government model. Tell this house about the leadership role that Canada is playing on this important topic. Good question. Well, President of the Treasury Board. I'd like to thank the member for his question and for his work on this issue. We've led by signing the onto the Christchurch call to action and by announcing Canada's very first uh, data charter. Sets them in the Canada. This week, Canada is co-chairing the International Summit for Open Government. Governments, civil society and thought leaders from around the world to come together and help us tackle threats to democracy and help chart a pathway forward together. So I invite all members of the House to join us as we work with governments to make government more responsible. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal Prime Minister's out-of-control spending includes a plan to run deficits for decades. And he has to raise taxes on Canadians to pay for it. His carbon tax isn't enough to pay for his big spending, so he's got to find a new way to take money from hard-working Canadians. Will the Prime Minister confirm that he supports these Liberals' plan to introduce a new tax on drinks? Honourable Minister of Health. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to making the healthy choice the easier choice for Canadians. And that's why that we've moved forward proudly with our healthy eating strategy. Last year, we banned industrial trans fats. We've also launched a wonderful revision of the Canada Food Guide that has been extremely well received by Canadians. And finally, we are moving forward with respect to restricting unhealthy food to kids. And let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, the policy that the member opposite is speaking about, we have no plans of moving forward with that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members are drinking, there must be too much caffeine in it. I'll, I'll have to be done.
The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Passenger Bill of Rights contains so many exemptions that it looks more like a list of official excuses than an actual Passenger Bill of Rights. Overbooking, unreasonable delays, cancelled flights. For more than four years, travellers have been promised that their rights will be respected. And yet on Friday, the Minister said that they might be waiting another six months just to please once again the airline industry lobby. Mr. Speaker, when the Minister wraps up his industry rights charter, Will he do one for passengers too? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are very proud of our Passengers' Bill of Rights. Our government believes that when a person buys a ticket, they have certain rights. I would encourage my colleague, who's obviously not familiar with the content of this Bill of Rights, to go on the Department of Transport website and read it before he says he speaks this nonsense. For Humber River Black Creek. Mr. Speaker, for decades Canadians have had to endure long delays at the airport. Hence the interest today. Cancelled right. flights and lost baggage with no clear, consistent rules to support them when such cases occur. My constituents are well aware of these issues and are looking to our government to make positive change. Can the Minister of Transport please update my constituents and all Canadians on the progress that's being made by this great Liberal government? Good question. Hey. Honourable Minister of Transport. Humber River Black Creek for her excellent question and her tireless work as the Chair of the Transport Committee. We in the Liberal government believe that when an airline sells a ticket to a passenger, that passenger has certain rights. That is why we implemented the passenger protection rights, which we announced last Friday and which will come into effect this summer. We believe that air passengers are entitled to certain rights, and this Liberal government will be there to protect them. The Honourable Member for chicoutimi le Fjord. Mr. Speaker. For more than three years, a Canadian citizen, Mr. André Gauthier, has been detained in Dubai and is now in Oman. Today, the Oman authorities are currently deporting him to Dubai, where he runs the risk of serving a life sentence in a country that has little regard for human rights. Canada promised the family they would intervene. What is this Liberal government waiting for to take concrete action on this matter? A Canadian's life is at stake. The Honourable Minister, Parliamentary Secretary. Canada is aware of a Canadian citizen detained in Oman. Our officials are closely monitoring the case and consular services are certainly being provided. I personally have been actively engaged on this case, including with representatives of the government of Oman. Uh, beyond that, I'm unable to disclose any further details. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to quote a response from the government to my question yesterday. With regard to pipelines, especially pipelines that cross provincial borders, it is up to the federal government to do the work. Except that doing the work, in Ottawa's mind, is just saying yes to pipelines all the time, no exceptions. And now with the ruling of the BC Court of Appeal, we have every reason to fear that the Energy East project will reappear in Quebec. Will the government commit to never reviving the Energy East project in Quebec? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the question really is unacceptable. There is no project before us on Energy East. So as long as there's no project before us, we can't really give you any position on a project that doesn't exist. But what I can say is that we take very seriously our responsibilities with respect to the environment while making sure that projects go forward and that jobs are preserved in Canada. We are moving ahead in the right way in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Well, Mr. Speaker, but good projects for them is always in the most polluting of, se of sectors. Since 1956, Ottawa has always said yes to the oil industry's demands when it comes to pipelines. Yes, every time and only yes. In Quebec, we don't want a new dirty oil pipeline. It's no to Energy East. What Quebec does not want, the Bloc does not want. So if it's not on the table, well, just great. Well, make a commitment. Will the Prime Minister commit to never reviving Energy East in Quebec? Will he make that solemn commitment? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Mr. Speaker, we respect our commitments to the economy and to the environment. We're investing in clean technology, renewable energy, and we are uh, committed to our traditional resources while they become more renewable. We are committed to zero emission vehicles. We have made investments in remote and indigenous communities. And we are the only party that has credibility, credibility when it comes to protecting the environment and developing the economy at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Skyview. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last month, the Minister of Natural Resources said a final decision would be made by June 18th regarding the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Now we see the project in parallel yet again. Thanks to the provincial government of British Columbia, we have already spent billions of dollars to buy this pipeline, Mr. Speaker, and we cannot wait for another year in court. We need, to, we need action now, and let's stop this trade and get the results Albertans and Canadians need, which is, of course, the immediate approval of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Can the minister confirm we are still on track for June 18th? Thank you. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, to meet our duty to consult, to respond to what we have heard from Indigenous groups, and with advice from the Federal Representative Jesse Sakabuchi, we communicated to Indigenous communities that a decision on TMX can be made by June 18, 2019. Our goal is to make a decision towards the end of this period. Merci, Mr. President.